Paul, 10,000 angels from one could have destroyed the world. Amen. But he died this for you and me. That's something like uh, the basis that I want to have my message for Sunday morning, if the Lord willing, Hallelujah. on what was Christ. And now we're expecting maybe these little girls could sing that song again for Sunday morning. Brother Wheeler, I certainly want to say that you sure got two fine little ladies there. And they're dressing and no makeup and everything. They look like Christians to me and sing like and act like it. And it's very fine. I believe I said to my wife the other day, we have certainly a clean-looking bunch of women around here. I appreciate that. They're long hair and clean faces and dressed decently. I, I admire you uh, every time that I, I come in. I said to media, I'd like to get them all in a row sometime and take their pictures showing show other churches. We are churches here. Where <laughs> we speak these things, they, they obey and we're glad. It does something for us. We know that when we, we have our petition, if our heart condemns us not, we know that God hears us. This morning, a friend of mine way away from here was laid out, hauled him away, and just barely living. Thought he'd be dead in a few minutes. They called. It was about daylight. I got out of the bed on the floor and started praying. For the old fellow was able by the grace of God to contact that spirit. He had come back. Got all right. Hallelujah. Come back again. You see, living with us tonight. Yet, glory God. That's old brother Dow, 91 years old. 20, 21 years past the time of his life's journey. But the Lord is good and full of mercy. Hey, so man. we're grateful for it. Now, uh, brother Neville, we look around at one another, and I know I just got a little. About one more service to be here, and that'd be Sunday. Yeah. And I, I don't want to take my pastor. I just love to hear him preach. Sunday night when he preached, I tell you, I went up here as a friend to this little drive-in to have a sandwich afterwards. Brother Evans and Sister Evans run into Brother and Sister Southman up there. Brother Southman and all of them was remarking about that wonderful message. And I tell you, I've lived on it all week almost. And some of them remarks that how that the ostrich thinks he had hit himself. Now, that's true. When he sticks his head in the ground, but the most of him is still looking out. So that's about the way we do. Sometimes we try to hide our head behind something. There's always, they we're still showing. You know, he sees every bit of it, you see. So I really appreciate that. I, but then I thought, well, I like to talk to the church. And I thought, well, I, I, Brother Neville gets to talk to you all the time. So <laughs> When I'm yes, down here, maybe amen. drop down. I don't want to be hypocrite enough and not out on a call or nothing. Set up there at the house and the church open down here. I, I've got want to be down here because I love you. Amen. I tell you, I, I certainly kind of the weather here doesn't agree with me, and I, the country doesn't agree with me, and I'm allergic to the air that's here. Just as soon as that air strikes me, I just break in hives right over. See, and there's nothing you can do about it, and I. And we don't feel good, none of us, when we're here. We Hardly one of us has been really feeling good since we've been here because we kind of got used to a high climate. But now, one thing that draws me here is you all. Amen. Right, you all. You know, you find lots of friends. I, I'm so grateful, I guess. I, if I just count personally people I know, it would be maybe millions around the world. It's once estimated by someone probably in personal knowing of about 10 million people. But there's something about uh, about home, about Amen. certain people. There's just, everybody's got that, these special people in your life. Amen. You know, I believe that. If there isn't, then why is our wife special to us? You know, why is our, see, we're, our wives, our husbands, and so forth, it's, it's special. And you have that with friends. There's something other that you just love to meet with them, just talk with them, these little spots. I can think of this old swamp here where this little church stood. And where before it stood here, there's nothing but a, a pond. That's the reason that road set way out there to get around that pond. This is actually the property. Of the street comes right by the door there. And, uh, but it was a pond. And I remember getting out here and trying to find a place to build a church to the Lord. And just a young boy. And I listened to these, this young fellow in Southern over here praying a while ago with all that enthusiasm I thought you know I used to be able to pray like that without catching my breath hardly and then you get older you kind of slow down a little you know and that 
you're still moving, but you're in second gear, as I told <laughs> Brother Woods out there. You, but and, and then as long, and then after a while you get down into low gear when you get about 70 or 80, I guess. But you know, then you're still moving. Oh, as long as you can move, what difference does it make? Just a little more time to get there. I remember how I was praying and right here in this weeds, right here where this pulpit stands now, just about where it's at. That's where I drove a little stake where I know to put the pulpit. The Lord God gave me this place. That's it. Now right there in the cornerstone lays my testimony of a vision in the morning I laid it. When I hardly could think then, said, this is not your tabernacle. But do the work of an evangelist, he said. And I looked out and I seen all the world there in the bright blue skies and people coming from everywhere. It's laying in the cornerstone there. How little did I think that would happen, even though the vision said so, but it doesn't fail. It's going to be there anyhow. <laughs> I've been in a lot of interviews this week because Sunday the gracious presence of the Lord came down and I supposed to have left Monday. I have, we haven't took a vacation yet. The kids, my vacation comes later, a little later on. But I uh, want to take the children on a little time. They've got to go back and go to school now. So I thought this week would be a good time facing Chicago next week in that meeting there. But then, the, the anointing of the Spirit, I thought, now's the time to have interviews. Now's the time of these, I can get caught up on a few of them. And I see some of the people sitting in prison that was in the room. They know where the Lord met with us or not. Amen. Strange thing, that everyone besides some woman that Billy put in just a, a space just before, some lady from Louisville, she had a little girl that was here. I think they really belonged to the Church of God in Louisville or something. But every case, every one of them had come in, before I left home, the Holy Spirit told me who would be here, what they'd asked, and I wrote down on a piece of paper and said just what they'd asked and the questions the way they'd asked them and how they'd be answered. And I'd tell them, I'd say, here's just what you, look now, a few minutes ago, I hear what the Holy Spirit reached over on the desk and say, see, he told me this before you ever come, see, but when it's up at the house, who would be there and what would be, what their attitude would be, and all about four even left home. I seen the time many times when it could be coming down the road praying. I'd see that prayer line pass before me and know every name that would be in the prayer line before I ever got here. Right. Amen. And know where they were sitting in the church and what they, how they'd be dressed and what they'd look like. You don't tell people everything like that. You, these things happen, you just don't tell them. It's not necessary to tell them. I just tell people things that I think is going to help them when the Lord presses me to tell them. Say, say this. You wouldn't want to tell everything you've seen because... That wouldn't be right, you see. You just you're get in trouble and everything else like that. You have to know how to handle those things by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. I've had people stand before me and ask me questions. I know exactly, but I wouldn't tell them because I just felt constrained not to do it. Remember, I believe it was last Wednesday night I preached on a prisoner. Yeah. See, Amen. see, you want to tell that person, but something says don't do it. The Spirit says don't do it. Don't do it. Yet a gift is looking right at it. See, don't do it. Don't do it. See. So you better not do it. Then you're in trouble with God. Yeah. Now, we don't come down here tonight just to stand here. We want to hear the word of the Lord. You've been praying. Yeah. And we've had a wonderful time. And, and I always, when I come down, I know I'll bring this little book of text because he's, uh, sometimes Brother Neville is so gracious, he just keeps asking me, will you do this or do that or <laughs> speak? And I look through here to find me a text of some sort and then we'll start from there. Yeah. And I'm, Sure. Now, be sure, Sunday. Now, I don't, we never know. We cannot tell. You see, I've come here at times with, with a text in my mind that I was going to speak on and get here and change it completely around. And I've had uh, scriptures roll down. I said, I'm going to use this text. I'm going to use these scriptures as they come down. I'm going to say this, that, or the other. I'll write down this like uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 15, and 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And Matthew 28, 16, so forth. You just put it in like that, down like this, and write them scriptures down and look down there and I know what the scripture says there. Sometimes I never even touch that. It goes all the way around a different way altogether. And yeah. we just don't know. So now, um, if the Lord is willing, uh, I want to speak in closing these little series of services since being here Sunday morning on a very important thing. So now, uh, come early. <laughs> Yeah, Prepare right. to stay at least a little bit late, maybe about two o'clock, something like that. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, I, I, I got around about uh, thirty or forty scriptures already wrote down on the subject. But I think what it, what I'm going to try to do, if the Holy Spirit will help me, 
to catch the message in the place where it's at now and build it right up where it started and build it right up into the present time. So that when I, I leave for Chicago, then I got to go straight to Arizona, then on, on and on. And it may be, as far as I know, it may be next year again, maybe next summer before I get back again to the tabernacle. It's just passing across this way again. Because I've got meetings, and Billy right now is working on overseas for a complete world tour beginning right immediately after Christmas. And I'm all booked up until around about December. And, uh, well, maybe the first week in December, Dallas. So then, um, then in January, we want to start on a complete world tour all the way around, completely. And we're working on that now, finding just where the Lord will lead. And, and I, I'm so grateful to the, even to the people, the ministers, as much as I say against uh, their denominations and things like that. You know, on the books laying right back there now, Brother Roy Borders takes care of the invitations. And since Christmas, the first of the year, there's been over a thousand invitations around the world. Mm-hmm. A thousand invitations has come in back there. So the Lord just has to direct me on which one of those to go to and what to do. We just depend on Him. You couldn't take them all. You, you couldn't take over uh, eight or ten of them in a summer if you had to in a, in a complete... Unless you just go one night here and one night there. And that's they're asking for two weeks and three weeks and so forth. Or as long as you can stay here. Some of them say it's as long as the Lord will lead and, and all like that. So you don't know just exactly where to start or what to do. So we're just laying them out before the Lord and saying, Now you tell us, Heavenly Father, and you help me pray with this matter. See, yeah. you help me pray that we can get this order. And I thought... After having healing service last Sunday, then maybe this Sunday, if we just take the teaching and bring it right up and show what, what the time that we're where we're at, what, what's 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 the the threefold purpose of God's great plan since before the foundation of the world, and bring it down to the day, the threefold Amen. plan of God, a plan. I'm working on the second part of it now, getting the scriptures out and hunting them out and placing them. Now. Let's see. Let's bow our heads just a moment. Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheepfold, we have assembled here tonight in thy most gracious holy name. We love thee, Lord, and we thank thee for this prayer meeting night, for the hymns of the church as we've sang them with joy in our hearts and and heard them as they come in clapping hands and And we went out on our knees and all poured out our hearts to you and thanked you for what you've done for us and and asked you to continue to walk with us. And now the hour has come for the reading of the word and for something to speak on to the people. Direct us in our thoughts, Father, and get glory and say something tonight through us that will help all of us to go out of here with a purpose in our hearts to live better and closer to you than we ever have. That's what we're here for, Lord. We're here to know more about you. And we pray that you will unfold your great being to us tonight in the revelation of thy word, that we might know how to be a a better Christian and and how to act in this last days. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, my uh, sight falls upon a texture of Isaiah. Isaiah 38. Let's read over to Isaiah. Isaiah 38. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord. Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and prayed unto the Lord, and said, Remember me, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. 
Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years. May the Lord add his blessings to this reading. It's a very uh, outstanding uh, subject for a short message here, I believe. I want to call it, God doesn't call man to judgment without first warning. Amen. And we are, we are, we are, we catch the, the background or the platform of it here and this text tonight. God warning man before bringing him to uh, his death. Now, everyone has this. We might say, well, this fellow died without a warning. No, no, no. God never, you don't know what was in that man's heart. You don't know what's been going on in his life. See, God never brings any man to his death without first warning him about it. Tell him it's something of preparation. God is, is sovereign and he, he knocks at the heart of every man, giving him the opportunity Amen. to come. Now, he might warn away and turn it down and, and shake his head to it and walk away. So, oh, it's just a funny feeling. I'll get over it. But anyhow, it was God. God speaking to him. Amen. And God never even brings judgment upon the earth without first giving the people a warning. God never does nothing without declaring it first, what he's going to do. And he gives people a choice, and you can, you can do right or wrong. That's his, see, God can never change. His nature, his program can never change from what he started with, because he's infinite in his program and his ideas are all perfect. So if he would change it, that would show that he'd learn more. So being infinite, he cannot learn more. His, his, first, his first decision is always perfect and there's nothing can ever change it. God before man ever was put, uh, had a chance to do wrong, God put him on the basis to where he could accept or deny. He could receive or, or not say, by the way, if that minister in here, Brother Baker, uh, I believe was on the, the interviews the other day, I've got his questions that he had wrote out for me on the serpent seed. I got him uh, laying back here now. Uh, if he's here, well, I, well, I don't see him anywhere right at the present time, but it's here. He and his wife, a very fine man and, he, and a woman, but they, they couldn't understand a few things about the teaching of the serpent seed, how that, that uh, some questions about what I'd said and, and sermons beyond that and, and talking about the, the pregnation and so forth. But I, uh, then it's just like a, a brother, a fine man, just a Christian for a couple of years or two, but just didn't understand, you see. It's hard if you don't. You have to depend on the Holy Spirit because this Bible is wrote in riddles. Amen. You just can't sit down and read it like a newspaper. Amen. It's hid. Yes, sir. How would you ever justify God when he told uh, Moses uh, up there, said, uh, uh, Now, don't you make any engraven images in his commandments. Don't you make anything like heaven, any, any angel or anything else. Don't make any engraven images. And yet, on the same day, he told him to mold two angels out of brass and put them right at the mercy seat where mercy's at. See, you have to know God in His nature before you can understand His Word. He, he, he has the key to that Word Himself. Amen. And he, He's the only one can uh, can handle it and open it. And so, uh, He's the one who has to reveal it. And now, we find out that His nature was here that always to warn a man uh, before judgment. To warn a nation before judgment and so forth. He always gives his warning, a reminder to we of a responsibility. We are responsible. Amen. And God has put us here on the earth for a reason. And that reason that he has put us here for, we are responsible to him for that reason. You should go to him and find out what he wants you to do. If you don't, if you went to work for a man, he'd give you a job on a ranch or something other, and you just went out to the barn and just sat down out there and say, well, see, you must go ask him what he wants you to do and then do it. If you're working for a man, find out what your duties is. And then if our life is on the, the earth here, then we should go to the one who put us here and, Lord, 
What would you have me do? What, what, what must I do? Why am I here? If it's to be a housewife, dishwasher, if it's to be whatever God wants you to do, then you do that the very best that you know how to do it. No matter how little, no matter how little it is, you must do it. You say, well, the trouble of it is each one of us wants to do the next man's job. We all want to pack the ball, as we say, you see, like this watch here. Now, every little movement in there has its place. Now, every part of it can't be the hands. Now, I only look at the hand to see what time it is. But if one of them little wheels in there gets out of order, that won't keep the right time. And that's the way it is with people. We've all, the body of Christ has got to be in their position in harmony. See? And then we can look around and see what time of day it is. See? Then the world's looking to see what it is. Eh? See, but they're watching you. And if you're just a little hairspring, mainspring, or whatever you are, you do the very best job you can at that. Now, because we have a responsibility that we've got to answer to God someday for. Every man that come on the face of the earth has to answer to God for our responsibility. And to many of us, a stewardship we have to answer for. We, this responsibility is a stewardship that's been committed to us by God. I don't care what it is. As I said a few moments ago, a housewife, then be a genuine housewife. That's right. If it's to be a farmer, be a genuine farmer. Whatever it is that God has put you to do, you've got a stewardship to that you've got to answer to God for because it takes all these things to do it. Hezekiah was told to make ready and to get ready because that he had to meet his maker. Now, Hezekiah was a king and a, a great man. Do you notice his plea here? Lord, I beseech you to consider me. I, I've walked before you with a perfect heart. What a testimony that is to, to, to us today. This should be. A man that walks before God, even death was pronounced upon the man, and yet God changed his mind about him. Yeah, because Hezekiah wanted to do something and God said he would give us the desires of our heart. Yeah. And Hezekiah's time had come and he, he got a cancer on him or something other. And they call it a borrel in that day, but we know borrels don't regularly kill you. They just get well, but it's perhaps a cancer. And it opened up like a borrel. And, and God told Isaiah, said, go up there and tell him that he's going to die. And Hezekiah had something he wanted to do yet. He had, he had, when you plead anything to God, you got to be a reason for it. It's just like this scripture that is so often referred to. If you say to this mountain, be moved and don't doubt, but believe that what you said will come to pass, you can have what you said. Amen. Now, that's altogether controlled on motive and objective. Yeah. Uh, it, or it won't happen. So you just can't go out here. That's where... Many of us make uh, many mistakes is going out and saying, Now, nah, I'll show you i got faith to do this. Now, you're wrong to begin with. God don't give you gifts just to play with it. As I was saying a while ago, they don't show you visions just to play with. That's nothing to play with. That's sacred. Just use it in as the Lord will let you be a prisoner to Him. No matter how much you want to Amen. tell that guy is wrong and what this, that, or the other, you hold still to God says so. Amen. Then when God says so, then you can come with thus saith the Lord. Until that, just forget about it. Amen. The, the world today, just like Hezekiah was then, it's been warned. It's constantly being warned. The church is being warned. And now these things just don't happen by, uh, by chance. They've all got something behind them. Now, Hezekiah being sick, Having this bar that wasn't by chance, God sent Isaiah up there and told him to set his house in order now because he's going to die. And Hezekiah wept and told God, I walk before the perfect heart and I, I pray you spare my life for a cause, a good cause, a cause of God. God told the prophets that go back and tell him. Now, isn't that strange? Hezekiah was the greatest man in the land. Hezekiah was a king and a godly man. He was a real man. If he could plead that before God and God didn't rebuke him for it, I've walked before you with a perfect heart. Yeah. Now that's a saying a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. And God never said, no, Hezekiah, you didn't do it, but he admitted he did do it. And he said, I'm going to, I'm going to spare your life a little longer. See, I'm going to give you a request. 
See, because he had been a just man. He had been a, a real servant to Christ. And then we feel that we have a right to ask something if, if our objective is right. Amen. And then our motive to it. Now, we see today that for the past many years, I'd say for the past 15 to more years, that constantly there's been a warning out across the nation. Amen. Repent or perish. You notice, I was talking today to the wife just uh, early this morning. And I, uh, early at breakfast, we were setting a table talking before I left. I said, wife, uh, she's uh, talking about Billy Graham and about his wife, just how common and everything they tried to live. I said, that is a real servant. When he tries not, when a man maybe makes two or three million a year out in his campaigns, but he doesn't receive it, his foundation takes it, placing it back into the work and the broadcast and so forth. And Billy gets about 25,000 a year. She said, how would he ever spend 25,000 a year? I said, he, he takes just what he has to have. That's all. He's got a home to pay for and everything. And went on. I said, I've got lots of respects for Billy Graham. I said, because he has a message and that message is repentance. And I, I'll tell you, there's nobody that I know of in the lands today that God has used with that message like Billy Graham. Oh, he's got a down pat. He just stands there, and I mean, he calls them politicians and church members to repentance. But that's as far as he goes. And here comes uh, Brother Oral Roberts, another great servant of the Lord. And there's nobody that comes out there and compare with Oral Roberts, that bulldog grip of if uh, you're just casting out evil spirits and calling the name of the Lord and and little sensations and so forth that, uh, about divine healing. That's exactly right. There is a messenger to the Pentecost. There is a messenger to the church denominational world, see? And the cold world. And then look around at our own little humble ministry. Standing, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, Amen. today, and forever, you see. Hallelujah. What's that doing? Calling that bridegroom, you see. see? It, it, it calls from both those groups. It's taking a wheel out of the wheel. You see oh, what I mean? Hallelujah. And then God confirms that message that Billy Graham preaches. God heals the sick by Oral Roberts' prayers. And God produces the things that Jesus proves that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's calling those things. That it's messages of the hour. And each one of those messages is calling, Repent or perish. Amen. That's right. Repent or perish. There's... No hopes. It's all gone. World's warned of His coming. Each one of the messages speaks and warns of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Both through the church denomination. Remember, God's always in threes. Like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and justification, bab and sanctification, baptism, and Holy Ghost, so forth. He's in threes. Now, God is that message of repentance to the church nominal. God's in that message of divine healing to the church Pentecostal. God's in the message to the bride. Amen. So we find out that all of them calling one to this, this to that, and that to that. God calling the church out of the world. The calling the church in, the denominal church into Pentecost and calling the bride out of Pentecost. See? Yeah. Like Luther, Wesley, and now. See, it's just all perfectly typed up. And there's no mistake about it. I've hit all around the ends of it and sides of it, inside and outside of it, and showed it by the Scripture and the chronology of it till we know that it's absolutely the truth. Amen. Hmm? There's no mistake. Sunday, I hope that God sinks it so deep Amen. that you'll never be able to get away from it. Sing. Now, God giving warning, prepare for a judgment. The atomic bombs are in the hangars. Everything's setting ready. And God, before He can let this thing happen, He makes a call down through like He did in Sodom. Come out of it. Get ready. There's something going to happen. Like in the days of Noah, before God sent the waters to destroy the world in the great Andalusian world that had come off into sin as Jesus clearly said that it was a day just like this. Yep. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. How that uh, the women on the rampage and 
and marrying and giving in marriage and, and the great scientific achievements and the smart, educated, going into the intellectual sides and the little humble flock sitting off to one side waiting the pending judgment and the escape. And before God set that judgment, He set a prophet. Mm -hmm. Just like He did to Hezekiah. He said, get ready for the judgments are ready to fall. And He made the people ready for the time. Noah made the people ready. And it was a call of mercy before judgment. Nineveh was made to know before their time. God looked down to Nineveh and He said, I'm, I'm just sick and tired uh, of these things. Uh, I, I understand that at the, though that great heathen Gentile world, their city, as it was in them days, they judged by city and house, by nations. Now, after the population has spread the way it has, he said, that great city is give over altogether to sin. And God, before he would send judgment, he sent a warning message. Come out of it. Get right. Watch the prophet never said nothing. But, but to get said within 40 days, this city will be destroyed. And oh, how sometimes it's hard to do such things as that, to tell people. If the prophet don't watch, he'll get in trouble because he'll kind of go off to one side, try and make it easier, compromise a little bit here and a little bit there. But the real prophet's got the order from God should never compromise nothing. He should absolutely lay it right on the line. That's the reason he used the spirit of Elijah so much. See, because that spirit always carried out his orders, you see. It brought his orders just exactly what it was. And always to come back to the Word. See? Always to bring him back to the Word. Now we find Nineveh in sin. And the prophet was hesitant because it was a Gentile world. See, it's a Gentile nation. Gentile people, not his own. It wasn't Hebrews. They were Gentiles. A great uh, ship, commercial sea port at Nineveh was. Great fishing uh, industrial there. The people fished and, and uh, they had, must have had a great sinful country there. Plenty of money and, and more money is plentiful and people are, in the popular opinion of the day, sin always sets in and violence. God was tired of it. So he had a prophet in the land. So he said to his prophet, Go down there to Nineveh and cry out and say, Within 40 days the city is going to be destroyed. Now, Jonah thought, Now, you know, I might get in a little trouble. So he wanted to be more sure. So he thought he'd take a little vacation and, and go down to Tarshish. And we found out that the, there's just 40 days left. See? So... The message is urgent. The time is at hand. Don't play around with other things and get a Bachelor of Art degree and find out something. The hour is at hand. Amen. So what's the matter? People today, we're trying to uh, build up big schools and have big things like that. When mercy, my, if we preach the coming of the Lord, what do we need with schools? We need repentance towards God. Amen. Amen. Like Hudson Taylor said to the young missionary, he said, a young Chinese boy come to him and said, Mr. Taylor said, the Lord Jesus has filled me with His Spirit. said, I, I'm so happy. said, shall I take 10 years now and get my degrees and so forth? He said, son, don't wait for degrees. If the candle's lit, go tell it. Amen. Go tell it. Don't wait for degrees. No, you'll be half burnt out before you get on with your degrees. That's when it's lit. If you don't know nothing else, just tell how it got lit. Just don't try to take somebody else's place or something place when you know it. Just tell what you know to be the truth. This is the way it come on me and this is how I feel about it. That's, if you don't know no more than that, say that. Let's go. The message is urgent. The time is at hand. And what if I say it? Say, well, now I'll wait and see how it gets along with that borrow first, you see. See, I, I, see, God told him, go up there and tell him right now. Amen. And, he told Jonah to go. Oh my. And when he got out there in that ocean and that deep sea and, and the 
ship got stalled in a storm and they hoshed up the sails and turned around and around. They wonder what the world was the matter out there. But they couldn't make out. It looked like the thing getting waterlogged and, and every man calling on his God. And first thing you know, Jonah was on his vacation. So he thought he might as well sleep. He must have went down the bulkhead of the ship and laying up there with his feet propped up asleep. And he said, Awake, old slugger, and call upon your God. And Jonah knew what was wrong. So does every man know. Amen. What's wrong today? Hey? And he said, It's all my fault. Take me and bind my hands and throw me out in the sea and then this trouble will let up. And they were kind of a gentleman-like bunch of fellows and they didn't want to do that, but they found out he was a prophet and knowed what he was talking about. He said, I, I thought I'd take my vacation first, but, but uh, the Lord don't want me to take this vacation. i got to get down there. i got a job to do. I thought I'd rest up a little bit before I went, but i, I got to go. The, the message is urgent. i got to get there. I'd imagine when that certain prepared fish uh, got uh, Jonah down in his stomach, he'd uh, done a bout face and throwed water all over the country and tuck out for an end of as hard as he could go. God was taking that message over there. And that certain prepared fish. And he took out for Nineveh just as hard as he could go. Because he, he had the messenger aboard and he had to get him over there. He took the wrong ship, but God had provided a ship for him. So, you know, God's able to do great things if we're just listening. See, he, he'll, make, he'll make ways where there is no way. He is the way. See, and when the message is absolutely urgent, as it is today, God provides a way. We notice again when Amos, I preached on this fellow Amos. If you'd like to read the story sometime, it's great. Read the story of Amos, first chapter of Amos. He's another type of the, the warnings before judgment strikes sin. Now, uh, the city that he was uh, going to warn against over there was a bunch of Jews that, that he all got kind of off of the beaten line and become a great tourist center and and I imagine as I give the illustration that morning speaking on him, that when his bald head come up over the top of the hill, his little eyes narrowed as he looked down, seeing the sin of that great nation and people, uh, his white beard as he fingered it like that. My, what a thing. But nobody knows where he come from. Nobody knows those prophets. They just rise up from somewhere and go the same way. But he went into the city with, Thus saith the Lord, Repent or perish, or God will destroy this nation. He'll, he'll wipe this place off of the earth. You've made an agreement with your enemy. And you're, you're at peace, you think, with your enemy. But all the time the Assyrians are, are building up out there. You can't walk two together unless you be agreed. That's all. So said, God wants us to separate ourselves. He wants us to come out from the world. Not try to live with the world and God too. Not try to fashion after the world and after God. You have to live for one or the other. You have to believe one or the other. Now, we find out that this Amos, he certainly predicted a judgment upon this people except they repented and, and mine. So, so well... Does it fit our day? I think this great city, as looking back to this again, the great city down there, how that is all give over and, and a great uh, an economy they had of everything prosperous and they thought they were just exactly in the will of the Lord because they were prospering. But they found out that God is not always the author of prosperity. No, God sometimes... When prosperity strikes, the church usually gets away from him. You know, God spoke of Israel one time, said, I found you blood in the field, and I washed you up and brought you in to be his own child. And then when you got big and a beautiful young woman, you played the part of a whore, he said. You, you, you just give yourself to every passerby. See, but when you were poor and needy, when, when you had need, you served me. But when I blessed you and gave you plenty, then you went away from me. And it's just about proved that way. Oh, my. Now, we find out that this prophet really struck down on that nation, this Amos. He's just a plowboy. But we find out that when he did, 
struck down and told them what it would be. And told them if they didn't get right with God, that the enemy that they had taken in partnership would be the very one that destroyed them. Now we find out that our proud America is not going to escape the wrath of God. As I spoke one day since I've been here, I'm sure it was here, uh, of everything at the end. You know, I I can't see nothing to build to. You can't build a politics. It's gone. You you can't build uh, to uh, social life because it's so demoralized. There's there, there's nothing that you can build to there, and uh, you can't put no hopes in nothing. How about the church? Well, you can't do them with the church. It's so formal and gone. There's nothing left. They've done sold out their birthrights for a mess of pottage, and and they're just waiting judgment. The Holy Spirit has crossed this nation Amen. showing His signs and wonders. They continually spurn His grace. Amen. He vindicates Himself and proves by His great vindication that He's a Word of God manifested in this day. Amen. And they still turn it down. There's nothing left now. You just can't always do that to God. See? All right. We find out. The first He sends His prophets with warning. He doesn't change his way, his method of doing things. He does not always strike when he warns. I want you to watch this quotation. God gives a warning, but he don't always strike the same time he warns. Did you notice that? Amen. And then when he doesn't strike, when he sends a warning, then the prophet is mocked. You didn't have it. You told a lie. Amen. You, you wasn't right. That this same thing might have been said to, to Isaiah. What do you think that man thought when he went up there and prophesied the king was going to die and then come back down and said, no, he's going to live? What about Jonah going through the street saying, oh, this city's going to be destroyed within so many days, 40 days, and then God didn't do it. See? You have to watch. God don't always strikes when He warns. But he, uh, here's one thing. Then the prophet is mocked. But if he is a vindicated prophet with the word of the Lord, see, signs of God vindicated as God said the prophet would be vindicated, which these men were, see, his word is not his, but it's God's and it will come to pass. It's got to come to pass if it's God's word. Only one thing can stop it. That's a quick repentance. Notice, Amos, he, he lived to see his prophecy. But when Amos spoke of that city, how it was going to happen, how God was going to cause the Syrians to come in and take them over and so forth, like that, how their own corruption would eat them up. Well, I believe if it's right now, I'm looking down here upon the Scripture, and if I got this counted right, it's around about 50 years after Amos prophesied. And now what do you think? A whole generation passed. Before Amos's prophecy come to pass. But if you'll read over here, it tells you, and it happened just exactly word by word what he said. Amen. Yes. Amen. John saw the book of Revelations. It never happened in his day. But we see it coming to pass just exactly. Amen. Amen. Daniel prophesied of the day of his day and all down through. He never lived to see it. He said, go your way, Daniel. Shut up the the book and, and close the book. You'll sleep in your lot, but at that day you'll stand. See? Now, I see, uh, uh, you don't always, God strikes as soon as he prophesies. Amos' prophecy, as I said, was 50 years later, it come to pass. But it did come to pass. The, the prophet is, a, is a, of the Bible, a real genuine prophet, is a special uh, a person. Not a special be any different from anybody else, but he's got a special job. Amen. See? And having a special commission, he's got to be special a little out, out of the way from the others to, in order to do that. Amen. It's just like God uh, likes his prophets to be an eagle. Now, an eagle is a special bird. He's just a bird, but he's a special bird. And he can fly higher than other birds. He can see farther than other birds. 
And now in order to go higher, he's got to be built so he can go higher. And what good would it do him to go up there unless he could see what he was doing that you got up there, see? So he has to be a special built bird, see? He's kind of in, a, in the hawk family. He's a ripper with the bill. And he eats, uh, uh, many of them are scavengers. He's about 40 different kinds of eagles. But you see, in the church, there is a pastor. And that pastor is a special person. He's built to where he can, uh, he can put up with the fussings of the people. He, he's a burden barrier. He's the ox of the team. He, he's a man that can sit down when the, somebody's got something against somebody else and sit down with them two families and take neither side and reason it out and bring it right back into sweetness. Okay? He, he's a pastor. He knows how to take care of things. The evangelist is a special man. He's a man that's burning like a fireball. He runs into a city and preaches his message and gets out of there somewhere else. See, he's a special man. The teacher is a special man. He sits back under the anointing of the Spirit and is able to take the words and put them together by the Holy Spirit that the pastor advances. Either one could not compare with him. And then we find out the apostle is a special man. He's a, he's a setter in order. He's a man that's sent from God to set the things in order. The prophet is a special man. A prophet is a man of whom the word of the Lord comes to because the prophet is so designed life that his subconscious and his first conscience is so close together that he doesn't go to sleep to dream his dream. He sees it when he's wide awake. Yeah, yeah, now that's something God has to do. See, he sees what's going. A prophet foresees way off. See, the things that is coming. Uh, uh, he sees the cup of God's wrath full before it is filled. <laughs> he can say, Thus saith the Lord. God will destroy this city except you repent. Why? He's an eagle. He rides way in honor. See? And he looks way off there and he sees that cup of wrath poured out. That's what the prophet's looking at. He ain't looking what's going on here. He's looking yonder. He's saying it's a coming. He can go so high until he can see that shade. He said the world will be dark, darkness and gross darkness. He's up high enough. The sun's shining now, but he sees that shade coming. And he's, he's, he's saying what he's looking at. Amen. It ain't here yet, but it'll sure be here. Amen. That's right. It's going to be here. Gross darkness upon the people. He knows it's coming. Years away, yet he sees it. Amos, that anointed prophet of God. He saw the, the darkness and the judgment. He's seen Syria come down with their chariots and sweep to there and slaughter them people out. He saw it coming and the judgment of God upon them. Now, 50 years before it happened. But you see, being a prophet, he was lifted up into the Spirit and he saw it far off. See? He saw the cup full before it was filled. Like Abraham. God told Abraham... Your seed shall come into this country and sojourn here for 400 years. And then I'll bring him out with a mighty hand because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. See, God knew that cup was going to fill up. He's speaking with his prophet. He told him, now, you see that cup of the Amorites down there. See, but their iniquity is not filled up yet, Abraham. Don't say anything about it now. Hold off. But it will come. And when their cups filled up, in them 400 years, I'll drive them out like locusts is before you, and I'll establish your seed here in this land. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the prophet of the Lord. Now, when he speaks of his vision, whether it's wrath or whether it's healing, Amen. it may linger, but it's got to come to pass if he speaks it in the name of the Lord. Hmm? It might be a blessing that he speaks for you. He might tell you a certain thing. You can't see it at all. You say, how can it be? What's a, I, 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 he told me, thus saith the Lord, this is going to happen, that was going to happen. And it ain't happened. The man's wrong. Now you'll be judged for disbelieving it. But it's going to happen anyhow. It's got to happen. Though it linger, the Bible said, yet will it speak in its season. It'll come to pass. The prophet's only looking off and seeing something. 
He's talking about what he's looking at. He ain't thinking about here and what you look like now. He's looking what it's going to be. And when he speaks that, if it's in the word of the Lord, it's already been spoken. There's nothing in the world can stop it, you see. Amen. That's right. Only God himself. Notice, now we find that when he, he speaks his vision, the prophet does. Now, sometimes he speaks good things. He speaks of your healing. All right, you might think it just can't happen. I haven't got any better. Then what does that do? That just brings the judgments of God upon you. Amen. That's right. See? Jesus promised to save you if you'd believe it. If you don't believe it, it won't, it won't happen to you. You've got to accept it. You've got to believe it. Amen. And you've got to know from where it comes from that gives your faith in God or your prophet. See? You've got to believe it. Now, we find out here that these prophets have spoke, they, they spoke, and what they said come to pass. If the wrath of God is poured upon the people, there's only one thing. If that prophet says there's something other is going to happen, there's only one thing that will stay the hand of God. That's repentance. Amen. Amen. That's repentance towards God. That stays His wrath. Now, don't wait for it. Do it then. Amen. God says anything, you do it like then. Hezekiah, as soon as he knew, he's a good man. But God said, your time has come, Hezekiah. And I, I must take you. I, I, I wanna, I'm going to take you out. Put all your house in order. And he, he, he said, it'll take me 15 years to do that, Lord. He, uh, it's, uh, you, I, I know I'm going, but it's going to take me 15 years to put my house in order. I can't do it right now. I, I haven't got the time to do it. I, I just can't get it done. Lord, let me live another 15 years so I can get this thing done. I can't put my house... See, God's commission was put your house in order. And Hezekiah said, I can't do it this year. It's going to take me time. I'll take this back and make this up and take it over this fellow here. It'll take me 15 years to do it. Just spare me to do it. Let me, let me give me a little time to do it. See? Then God said, I, I, I'll be lenient. But he had to die anyhow. <laughs> And begin to tuck his time, he backslid during that time. See? It would be better if he went on without it being set in order. That's right. But he gave him 15 years longer to put his house in order because quickly, what did he do? He said, Lord, I'm slow. I need 15 years to do this. You commissioned me to put my house in order. I can't do it for 15 years because I got a loan here and I got this over here and I got this over here to do. Now, he was a godly man. And God's words got to happen anyhow. It's going to come to pass anyhow, but he just stayed it for a little while. See? Hold it off to him. Then he done a sin during that time. He said, I won't make it come up on him, but I'll have visited it up on his children after him. You know the story. Now, we find out that a quick repentance sometimes holds the wrath off a while. Now, we find out that Nineveh, God said, go down there and cry out to that city now and tell them, if uh, within 40 days the thing's going to fall. And my, did they ever repent. As soon as they seen that prophet coming through the street, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the place will fall within 40 days. The place will fall. The, even the king commanded a, a, a fast through the country, mourning, put on sackcloth, put ashes, not upon your own head and upon your body and upon your flesh, but upon your cattle, upon your beasts of the field, put ashes and sackcloth. What a repentance! Now, when we find out there, we notice if the prophet don't watch real quick, see, get his wits together and go to God, you'll find out something right there. If you don't watch, now look at Isaiah. He just spoke his prophecy, went on back into his little wilderness hut, and when he did, the Lord never spoke back to the king that was praying. He has a way of doing things. There's a prophet in the land. The word of the Lord comes to his prophet. He went out there and said, Isaiah, go back and tell him, I have heard his prayers. I have understood that, it, that he thinks it's going to take him 15 years to do this. I seen his tears because he wanted to do the job so bad. It's going to take him 15 years, he said, to do it. Go tell him and I'll let him have it then. See, why? He commissioned, he commissioned Isaiah to go tell him, thus saith the Lord. Then if there's any change in that or lingering, he's going to happen anyhow. He died just the same. But said, if there's anything in that, then he's obligated to come back to the man that he sent, thus saith the Lord to 
He told Isaiah, go back out there and tell him. Now, Jonah took a different attitude. Gets up on top of the hill and said, "What well, be good it never was born. And oh, how he went on. And God had a little gourd to come up and make him some shade till he got cooled off up there. But he said, now here I went down there and there goes Sam, a false prophet. And God spoke to him and said, look at that city down there. Look at there, Jonah. That the whole city is repenting with sackcloth and ashes. Then he told him about the little gourd and the worm that cut it down. One day, the Lord willing, I'm going to come to the tabernacle and take a series just on Jonah. Oh, there's so many great, that east wind blowing and all. Oh, my, there's so many things in there. Just, it's thrilling. Them nuggets in there. It's all types right in. Fit. It even brings Jesus Christ in it and everything else. Of course, every line in the Bible brings Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. That's our Sunday's lesson. So we'll find that, the Lord willing. But notice, these things that you, if you're sincere, and tell God, now, you have to watch. I'm going to show you another Jonah in a platform tonight. One night, there was a people that come here, the lady, maybe some of the people here tonight, so I won't call the name. You probably know who it is. But they come here, fine bunch of people from down in Kentucky. And they, um, they uh, come here for years. But the people being fine people, good friends of mine, my, they, were, they were real friends of mine. But they just one of those kind of people that when a revival was going on, they could come to church. When the revival was off and the load was pulling, nobody would pull. And all the children were here on the cradle roll. They had to, when we had our classes and things. And uh, one day I come home about four years ago or five, something like that. And this young girl, which is about eight years old, when she's on the cradle roll, she had been married and had two children. And she was laying out in the hospital out here at the point of death. She was uh, about four months, five, with a baby. And the baby had died, and they couldn't operate because she had uremic. And they couldn't operate. So I had to let the mother die, too. Can't operate and see the baby kill her like that. So they had, she was just dying. That's all. There was no chance for her. I went out to see if she sent for me. <clears throat> and I went into the hospital, and there she was under oxygen tent. I raised up a little flap, talked to her a little bit. And I said, you remember me? She said, sure, Brother Bill, I remember you. I said, uh, how is it? The, do you understand how sick you are? She said, I do. So that's why I sent for you. I said, well, why, how is it with you and the Lord? She said, Brother Bill, I, 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 I'm not ready to go. Well, there we got down and prayed, and her mother and her husband, many of them in the room, and the mother and husband started crying. And, and then I... I asked her, and she got right with God, paid her vows, and come back and made God the promise that if she'd be forgiven, how she loved him, and sorry for her sins, the way she'd lived, and went on with her repentance and crying. And after a while, I got up and went out of the building, and the, the next morning, they called me up to come back out there. And to come to find out, they come in that morning for a test, and to see how the, the uremic condition had advanced and found out she didn't have a speck of it. It was all gone. Every bit of the uremic poison had left her. Amen. The doctors were so excited that they said, My, well, this is something very strange. They said, we, we'll get her ready. And said, if it's still that way, but in the morning, said, we'll keep giving her penicillin or whatever they was giving her to keep the infections down. Said, we'll operate and, and take the dead baby. Before she set in something else. Said if she's all right. Well, two or three times that day, they tested her again. And that night late, they tested her. Nothing wrong. Oh, perfectly all right. And they prepped her. Talk her out from the oxygen tent. Everything is fine. They just go to operate on the next morning. Take the baby. Well, I went out there. And because that this was done, I, I never knew it. I never knew that the Lord never told me nothing about it. You could ask the uh, people if you wish. So they, she never said it would. But oh my, to see such a, a thing, her husband being a sinner come over and said, uh, Brother Branham, I, I want to give my life to the Lord Jesus. And I said, all right. Just kneel down here, take hold of your wife's hand. And then you walk this straight life together. And the mother come back, she said, Brother Branham, you know, here's me and my children. said, we've all been in and out and in and out and around the tabernacle and things. We sit and listen at you preach and we'll go up the altar and come back. Said, I'm back to you, Brother Branham. She said, I want to come back to the Lord Jesus. 
for his goodness to my child. Well, you see, that, that's very nice, but you don't come to the Lord Jesus because of that. Along towards midnight, 12, 1 o'clock, her mother dozed off sleep. She said, um, called her and said, Mother. And she said, Yes, honey, what do you want? She said, You know, I'm so happy. She said, I'm so glad of you being happy. Said, I'm at peace with God. And said, oh, how fine it is. In a few minutes again, she called back. She said, Mother. Said, yes. Said, I'm going home. And she said, I know you are. She said, yes, sweetheart. Said, the doctor will take the baby tomorrow. And then about a day or two, when your incisions heal up and get away from here, you go back home and be happy again. You and your hubby and little children, you'll be a Christian and live for God. She said, Mother, I mean, I'm going to my heavenly home. She said, sure, honey, at the end of the journey. She said, this is the end of the journey. Oh, she said, nah, what's the matter? She said, the end of the journey. So she said, yes, mother, within a few minutes, I'll be gone. Well, she thought she just got nervous and delirious. She called the nurse. The nurse taking her respiration. Everything is normal. And within five minutes, she was gone. She was dead. And then when I come back, home and a week or two after that I think brother Graham preached the girl's funeral when I come back home and meet he told me that that girl died that night I couldn't I went to see the mother yeah I, I, I don't know what caused me to do it but I said Lord God you, you owe me an understanding and after me going out there and, and telling that husband and and him coming to the Lord after you done these things for him and all that cat, and then take that girl's life like that? I said, you owe me understanding. When you tell God something like that, he'll leave you sitting alone. I don't, you don't owe me nothing. I'm in debt to him. Well, he just let me pout it out for a few days, you know. And after about three or four months, one day I was out on the creek bank and the Lord spoke to me in a vision and said, now go to her mother. And say this to her mother. Did not her time come the year before that when she was drowning in a creek on a picnic? She should have went at that time. But I had to take her when she was ready to go. And that's why all this happened. Why you went out there? Then I got down and cried. I said, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Your poor, stupid servant. I should have never said that, Lord. Now I went back down to the lady. She lived over here on Market Street. Now I went over to her and I said, I want to ask you a question. She said, sure, Brother Bill. And I said, is it true that this girl, uh, uh, almost drowned? She said, that's right, Brother Branham. Said her husband, and they, they had to get her out of the creek and said they had to use artificial respiration at prone pressure. And they had to get a machine and pump the water out of her. Said she had her skirt on, this having a picnic. She was out there and stepped in some sand, slipped off over her head and strangled in the water. They didn't notice her and directly seen her coming up and going down. And they run in and got her and brought her out and said she almost died. Said she, I said, that was her time to go. See, God knows what he's doing. Now, the Lord probably would have told me that if I hadn't taken the attitude that I did. Lord, you owe me to tell me about that. He don't owe you nothing. I stood in a meeting one night and heard a, a, an evangelist uh, uh, praying for a sick person and said, God, I command you to heal this person. Who command God? See? Uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't even intelligent. See, uh, because... It, God, He does what He wants to. Can the, can the clay say to the potter, Why did you make me thus? See? Certainly not. But if the prophet will keep still and then seek the Lord for the answer, there's the answer there. See, just like on this person's asking on the, uh, the serpent seed question, you see. Just, uh, just watch and don't, don't, be, don't be in a bigger hurry. And then... Uh, now, God always brings to pass everything to work together for good to them that love the Lord. Now, if, if Nineveh would not have repented, then the judgments of God would have been upon them. Now, remember, the prophet must listen. It was a warning. Now, the same thing to this nation. 
Then you say, Brother Bram, last Sunday you said there wasn't a hope. Yes, why? It's spurned, it's called. Yeah, it's got to receive it. Yeah. It's going to receive it. There's coming a time when this nation's going to go to pieces. I saw it in 1933. See? I looked off. He said, uh, you might have said, well, it didn't happen then. But it's going to happen. Amen. Neither was Mussolini in power. Neither was the Maginot line built. Neither did a car look like an egg in them days. And the thing, neither did a women elect a president that would look like a, a college boy and all these other things. Neither would there be a Catholic president and so forth spoke of. About 30 years ago or more, these things were predicted, but he only showed me way off down to the end. Yeah, and as that thing approaches time by time, that cup's filling up. Amen. And repentance has been preached by Billy Graham, old Robertson, who else? Prophets and so forth, this cross the nation with signs and wonders, and she continually wades into sin. That's the reason they don't repent. Repent brings it. Notice, Ahab never repented at the rebuke of Elijah. If Ahab would have repented and walked softly before God, the thing would never happen. But Ahab come down there and done took Naboth's vineyard and had him murdered and all these evil things in Jezebel. That prophet walked out there with, Thus saith the Lord. But what did they do? She only threatened to kill him. What happened? His prophecy was fulfilled. The dogs he heard licked Ahab's blood. Amen. Just exactly according to his word. He saw the cup full. Amen. That's the reason that little Micah saying the same thing. How could he bless what God had cursed? See, his, his word, his prophecy was in harmony with the word. Herod, he never repented when John said, It's not lawful for you to have that your brother's wife. He never repented, but what did he do? His wife required the head of the prophet. Yeah, Look at the filth he went into. Look what happened to him. Look even today in Switzerland, the, the blue waters are rejecting him. Still borrows as a, a commemoration. Sir, he didn't repent when he was rebuked of the Lord. John told him, no matter what he was a proclamator or whatever he was, or the emperor or whoever he might be, he must repent when God calls a wrath upon him. How many times has the prophets I got um, you know, wrote down here, but we won't have time because we've got about ten minutes longer. If no repentance, then judgment is sure to come. Hezekiah repented. See? Nineveh repented. Ahab, never repent. Nebuchadnezzar, never repent. The people in Noah's times, never repent. And the judgment swept right on in. See? Now, but he first warns everybody. Everybody gets a warning. Now, seeing the time is at hand, let everyone that feels that there is a warning repent quickly before the wrath of God strikes. Now, Let's bring it down to the Branham Tabernacle. See? We have seen these things and know them to be the truth. We know that it's absolutely the truth. The commission of the Word is, if you will repent and be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is to your children and them is far off. See? Now, a man, Mr. Dow, asked me here not long ago. He said, Brother Branham, I'm getting old. I'm getting weak. 91. He said, do you, do you think I'm, I'm ready to die? Do you think I'm ready to go? you think I'm saved? I said, Mr. Dow, did you ever go to a, a doctor uh, for a physical checkup? He said, yes. And you tell him, now what the doctor does, he's got a book laying there. And he takes this book and he finds out now the first thing I ought to do to that man, check his heart. So he gets the stereoscopes and puts them in his ear, checks his heart. And I said, then the next thing he gets, he finds out his blood pressure with a, with a pressure on his arm. Then the next thing he does, he takes a urine specimen and whatever more and some blood out of him and, 
all these different things. He goes through all of it, and if he can't find nothing, takes the x-ray. If he can't find nothing, they say, Mr. Dow, you're, you're physically all right. What's he basing that upon? On the conditions out of his medical book that if there's anything wrong, according to the head scientist, it'll show up here. It'll do this year. It'll do that there. Therefore, as far as he can know anything about it, you're all right. See? Physically. Now, I said, in this case, I, I'm given an, a soul examination. See? And God, for the soul, only has one instrument. <laughs> That's right. That's his word. <laughs> That's his word. And Jesus said in St. John 5.24, He that heareth my word. Now, that hear doesn't mean just to listen to the noise. That hear means to receive it. Who can receive my word? <laughs> Amen. Amen. He that hears it. Don't stand still so nonsense. Them things are nothing to it. I don't believe that. He that hears my word. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's the word of Jesus, which he is the word. There you are. If you can hear my word, he said, and believe on him that sent me, he has passed from death unto life and shall not even come to the judgment, but's already passed from it. Amen. Amen. I said, how's your heart beating now? <laughs> he said, I believe it. I have heard it. I have received it. I said, then according to the head specialist, the chief operator, the chief doctor of eternal life says you've passed from death unto life and shall never come to the condemnation. So when I heard you preach on the name of Jesus Christ for water baptism, I walked right in behind you, and you uh, baptized me. said, I, the man that I once was, I'm not that man no more. Something's happened to me. I used to care nothing about it and went on the other way, but I've turned and started back this way, and my heart burns day and night to get closer to him. <laughs> every word of it, I believe. I say amen to every bit of it. I don't care how it cuts me. I want to measure right up to it. And I have as far as I know. I said, it seems to me like your heart's beating pretty good. I believe you're spiritually able now. He said, wonder if there would be when the rapture comes. Can I go in it, Brother Branham? I said, it's not me to say who goes in or who does not. He said, well, I'd like to be living. I want, I want to see the rapture so bad. I said, all right. Let me see what the, uh, the science book says here to it. The soul science here. I said, well, it says this. In 2 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, it said, We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, that means hinder, those that are Resting, <laughs> asleep. For the trumpet of God shall sound, and those who are asleep or resting shall wake up first. <laughs> Take on immortality. Then we which are alive at that day, at that time, after they've done raised up, see, then we shall be changed in a moment, a twinkle of eye, and meet with them, and they go up to meet the Lord in the air. Be Amen. caught up together with them. Whether you sleep, whether you don't, whether you do or whether you don't, wherever you're buried, if you're not even buried at all, you're coming anyhow. There's nothing can hold you. You'll be there. I said, Brother Dow, if Jesus doesn't come until my great, great, great grandchildren's grandchildren, you'll still be there right on the moment. That's exactly. And it'll be there before they're ever even changed if they go. That's right. Amen. There is a coming blessing. Just the same as there is a coming wrath. Oh, we have to be looking for one of it tonight. You have to either be looking for the wrath to fall upon you and for destruction, or either you have to be looking for the resurrection of the Amen. Lord Jesus, Amen. the same Praise God that God. promised one. I'm so glad I'm watching for the Praise coming God. of that glad millennium day Amen. when our blessed Lord shall come and catch His waiting bride away. Oh, my heart is yearning and groaning for that Praise day of sweet release. When our Jesus shall come back to earth again. Amen. Then sin and sorrow, pain and death of this dark world shall cease in that glorious reign with Jesus of a thousand years of peace. Oh my. Hallelujah. And shall forever be with the Lord. Hey, what God said, it's got to come to pass. They shall build houses, they shall inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and they shall eat the fruit of them. They shall not plant in another inheritance. <laughs> they'll plant their own vineyards and stay with it. Amen. 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 They shall not hurt or destroy all my holy mountains. Amen. Amen. When this world will take 
takes on immortality, this, this death is swallowed up in victory. Then we shall see him as he is and have a body like his own glorious body. Oh, what a time to come. The same God and the same prophets that predicted the word of God or the wrath to be poured out, poor, also told of these coming blessings. Amen. I'm so glad God never does give a a nation a, a destruction without warning. He never gives a man a destruction without warning. And now, if he does that, we have got something that's happened to us. The vindication of the signs of the last days Amen. with us. The great Holy Spirit moving among us and charging the church with His presence. Amen. Vindicating His Word. Then the church is getting ready for a climb into the sky one of these days by the power of God because it's a warning to lay aside every weight in the sin that's easily beset us we might fly with patience this race that's set before us to the author and finisher of our faith. God bless you, church. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Yes, sir. If you feel His presence, go to Him. If there's anything wrong in your heart, make it right. We ain't got much time left. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Do you believe Him? Hallelujah. Oh, my. Won't that be wonderful there? What a time when I see the old veterans back down or walking hey. down to that paradise. Oh, my. I'm looking for that hour. I remember hearing my brother say when coming back across the seas, when the old battlefields and things said, those old veterans, when they come in the side of that Statue of Liberty, they roll them cripples up there so they could see the Statue of Liberty. You see it first on a ship when he come up because it's so high. And you see an arm standing up there. So that man just break down and cry. And just grab a great big man standing there and just fall right over on the deck and start crying. What was it? A sign of liberty. Yeah. Everything that he ever loved lays right behind that sign there. Yeah. Oh, but what will it be when I hear the old ship of Zion blow that morning and I see the banners yeah. waving? Yeah. When the battle's over and the victory's won. Yeah. Hallelujah. And we're coming home where death, sin, and hell is conquered. And there's no more sin, no more death, no more sorrow. I can just hear the whistle blowing. <laughs> Oh, we're nearing the city. Yes, sir. The breakers are coming in. The old ship's moving into our place. God, help us to live for that hour. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we are a people who are, are trying our best with all that's in us to walk in the light of the gospel of your great uh, gospel that you died to make right. We are so thankful to see in this evil dark days that we're living now in this hour that we see the signs appearing. Oh God, as it is the handwriting on the wall, we thank Thee, Lord, that we can see it and know that deliverance is close at hand. We preach, we cross the country, we see You work. Great signs, show Yourself daily, every year. There's not a year passing by what great is supernatural signs is striking the earth. And we see it, knowing that the great army of God marches on. Oh, not many in number, but what a powerful group that's got eternal life. Said they shall run through a troop and leap over a wall. Yes, the troop of death will have no holders to it. She'll run right to it, leap over the wall between natural and supernatural and go into the arms of God, into that great eternity. Lord God, we thank you for this. We know the time is approaching at hand. I pray, God, that tonight, if there be some here who doesn't know you, who's never made their peace, and maybe tonight, while we've been speaking, a little voice has been speaking down their heart, I feel the warning that I can't be around much longer. Oh, God, may they put the house in order right now. May everything be set. May the coldness, maybe they're Christians, but they just haven't, They've lived under this so long and seen so many things, they've, they've just lost the value of it. It's the things, they take it lightly instead of real deeply and sincerely. Oh, God, let us check up tonight. Granted, knowing that these great things are only warning us of the soon rapturing church. And if we're laden with sin, with unbelief, and with slothfulness, we shall not make that rapture. We know it, Lord, so we pray that you'll burn into us the Holy Ghost down into our hearts. Oh, God, set our souls on fire with your blessings. Help us to understand. Now bless the people together. Bless our precious pastor, his wife.
blessed deacons, the trustees, all the laity together, forgive our sins, heal our sicknesses, Lord, and set our hearts aflame. And may we go from this place with a warning message as we meet the people in sin and tell them, friend, aren't you shameful that you do such things, knowing that you have to meet God someday? Grant it, Lord. I commit them to you now, commit the message, and all together to work together for your glory. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I love him. I love him. Because he first loved Just my salvation on Calvary's tree. Don't you love him? Think of what we are. Look how far up the road we are, friends. Just look back down the road from way down under the days of Luther and Wesley on down through the ages. Look here where we're at. Right here at the top of the pyramid. Right here where God has proved it, that the Bible through the seven seals has perfectly been revealed. Waiting only now for them seven mysteries right at last on the coming of the Lord and the rapture of the church that might happen before morning. Oh, my. I love Him. Sincerely now. I love Him. Because He me and purchase my salvation on Calvary. As we quietly now, do you realize that each one of us in here is got to leave here, leave this world? Do you know that a man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble? Did you know that because that we're born of that tree from the Garden of Eden of death, that we've got to die? We're the fruit of our mother's womb. And we have to die. We have to separate this life. Young or old, it makes no difference. If the oldest man or woman in here lives through the night, she'll outlive or he'll outlive many 10, 15-year-old children. Hundreds of them will die across the world before morning of children. So all that matters is what are you doing right now? This may be your last opportunity. Young or old, you're able to get to church. Don't leave one thing undone. Be deeply and sincere. Lay every sin and everything aside. Look straight in the face of God and ask the question, Lord, do I please you? What else could I do, Lord Jesus? I'll never have the opportunity no more after this life is over to serve you. This is the only time I have. Lord God, only let me know what you want to do. If I should go do this or I should do that, I'd gladly do it. Do we, do we think that sincerely? Does the little fellows think that? Does the middle age think that? Does the old people think that? Does the teenage think that? we got to go. And how do you know that we all won't be gone before morning? We don't know it. You say, that worries me. It shouldn't. Frankly, it should make you most happy Amen. to know that you're leaving this old pest house. Amen. There's another world. You don't have to leave very far. It's right with you. It's right around you. You just you God only gives you five senses. And that's the contact so much of this this world. But there's another world that you haven't got any senses to contact. You can't contact it because you don't have it. For instance, I said Sunday night, maybe you didn't get it. What we got five senses see, taste, feel, smell, and hear. But what if you didn't have the sight? You just had taste, feel, smell, and hear. And somebody received their sight and said, there's another world. Sun, and, and feelings, you bump into things, and what it is, can tell you what it is. 
Why, you think the person's crazy because you don't have that, that sense of, of sight. Nobody ever had it, you know of. You've heard of people who said such things that, but you doubted it. But we know by the sense that it's real. Amen. It's a real place. See? It, 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 it's a place where the, you can see. Your sense declares that. Now, the only thing you do when you die, you just change those five senses. Glory. You just receive another sense. And you're alive with a higher sense, thousands of times higher than this in another life. A life where there's no death, where there's no sorrow. And the things that you don't know nothing about now, you see it plainly when you cross there. You don't understand it now because you're bumping into it. You haven't got that sense. You say, I, I feel a strange feeling here tonight. looks to me like there's a, uh, I just want to cry or shout or something. It's the angels of the Lord. Like somebody say, oh, you know, never to have a sense of sight. Say, once in a while I feel something real like, a feeling like warm. He'd say, it's the sunlight. What is the sunlight? I never did see it. You know, see, never did see it. Don't know what it is. See, somebody over there has to tell him somebody can see it. Oh, my. See? We just change. We just change. Don't be afraid of death. Death ain't nothing but a scarecrow. Jesus conquered it. Amen. Even when Paul come down at the end and said, Death, where is your sting? Where's your scare? Grave, where is your victory? You say you got me? Huh. I want to point you back here to Jerusalem. There's an empty tomb there, and I am he that conquered both you, death, and hell. And I'm in him, and you can't hold me. I'll rise again. <laughs> Oh, my. They said, there's a crown laid up for me that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me. And not only me, but all those who love His appearing. Amen. You love Him. You want to see Him come. You're waiting for Him. It's a long story. It's a, it's a long wait. It's a love affair. But you just can't wait till you see Him. <laughs> oh, my. That's the way it is. Oh, that's the time we're looking Amen. for. That's the hour. If your heart's not like, like, like that tonight, friend, be careful. See? Be careful. Don't let the enemy deceive you. When the Holy Spirit in here wants to take its flight to its maker, to its master, there's a love affair that no one can tell about. And that's right. It's real. It's real. So if there's a warning saying you're not ready for that, and remember, God might be getting you ready for something. See, you're not ready to say, well... If I get baptized, the Holy Ghost then, well, maybe the Lord will take me. No, not only that, you're just then getting ready to live. You, you ain't ready to live until you get the Holy Ghost. And then when you get the Holy Ghost, then you're just fit to live. You wasn't fit to live before that, see? But you're now you're just fit to live after you got the Holy Ghost, see? Just getting you ready. See, people say, well, I got to get ready to die. Oh, my. I get ready to live. <laughs> Amen. The thing of it is get ready to live. Live in Christ. Victorious life over sin, death, hell. I already have the victory. He's my victory. And I'm His evidence. I'm the evidence of His victory. Amen. That's it. How do you know He got... I got it. Amen. He gave it to me by His grace. I feel it. I know it. I see it working in my life. It changed me. And according to this book here, He said that I had eternal life and would not be able to come to the judgment that I had passed some death of the life because He took my judgment for me. And if He paid the price, don't try to bring me to any judgment. He's done took it for me and I accepted it. Yes, sir. So there's no more judgment. There's no more, no more death. Oh, I have to leave the church and leave the people someday. But that, if the Jesus tarries, and if that happens, well, my, I ain't dead. I can't die. I got eternal life. How can he die with eternal life? See? Always in the presence of God and forever shall be with him. Amen. That thrills my heart. My, makes me all start preaching again. See? That's right. Oh, he's wonderful. Isn't he? Wonderful, 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 isn't Jesus my Lord, a oh, wonderful eyes have seen, ears have heard, what's recorded in God's Word, isn't Jesus my Lord, wonderful, I love that testimony, eyes have seen, ears have heard, what's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus our Lord wonderful? Oh, I love Him. He's my peace, my life, my, my hope, my King, my God, my Savior, my... Oh, my, my father, my mother, my sister, my brother, my friend, my... Everything, you see. Um, 
We used to sing a little song like that. You know, you all ever get them little Pentecostal songs like, uh, I hope they got that recorder turned off. <laughs> uh, that's what we used to sing. He's my father, my mother, my sister and my brother. He's everything to me. He's everything. He's everything to me. He's everything, He's everything to me, for He's my father, my mother, my sister, and my brother. He's everything to me. Remember when we used to sing that? Any of you remember it my years ago? And then we used to say, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, He died upon the cross, and I know it was the blood for me. You remember that old song? Amen. Let's see, what was that little we sang? Let's see. Oh, won't you watch with me one hour while I go yonder, while I go yonder. Oh, won't you watch with me one hour while I go yonder and pray? I'm overcoming, I'm overcoming, I'm overcoming, I'm overcoming. For I love Jesus, He's my Savior, and He smiles and He loves me too. Used to be old brother Smith, the colored brother. Used to be down here at the corner. Oh, I'd hear those colored folks down there. I'd just sit there screaming, and crying, and everything. Yell, shake my car all over, and jump all around like that. They'd all clap their hands. Oh, won't you watch with that little beat the colored folks has? You know, nobody can sing like that. You might as well forget it. See? One hour while I go yonder. Oh my! I'd sit there, I said, "Oh God!" This little old boy, about twenty years old, I'd run around around that car and just shout and praise God like that. <laughs> Oh, what a time. That's this early beginning when the God was just moving among the people like that. Now we're coming to a strong church. Not many in members, but powerful in the Spirit. Amen. 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 How wonderful. Then there used to be a little song. I remember the day down there in Chattanooga, Tennessee, when I met this, uh, not Chattanooga, it was down in uh, Memphis, where I met this little colored uh, woman, you know, Standing out there, you've heard me tell about, you know, her boy had a venereal disease and she had this man's shirt tied around her head, leaning over the bench like that. And the Lord stopped that plane there and wouldn't let it go somehow. And they told me, come get it. The Holy Spirit said, take a little trip and go down this way. And I went walking out there singing. I thought, my, my plane's about ready to leave. Just kept saying, move on, keep on going, keep on going. Just the early part of my ministry. I looked, leaned across the fence down there in a little bitty shanty, little place there. There's an old sister standing there. Oh, she was looked like one of these uh, sisters on the uh, Aunt Jemima pancakes. Great big fat cheeks, you know, and her, 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 her shirt. Back. She leaned across the gate like that. And I, I sang that little song about little, what was the, I forget the name of the little song I sang. Now it's something about, about this little Pentecostal shoddy song, a little jubilee. And I just quit singing. I got pretty close. I walked by and she sat there and tears running down their big fat cheeks. I wanted to hug her. She said, Morning, Parson. <laughs> I said, Auntie, what'd you say? She said, I said, Good morning, Parson. I said, How'd you know I was a parson? Now, to the people in the South, that means minister, you know. I said, um, How'd you know I was a parson? She said, I knew you was coming. <laughs> I said, You knew I was coming. I thought, Oh, here you see. She said, Yes, sir. Said, did uh, you ever read the story in the Bible, Parson, about that Shunammite woman? I said, yes, Andy, I've read it. She said, I was that kind of woman. She said, I asked the Lord if he'd give me a baby, me and my husband, I'd raise it for him. Said, he did. He gave me a baby and said, I raised it fine, boy. Said, he out the wrong company, Parson. He got a bad disease. And said, he's laying in there dying. He's been dying for about two days now. He ain't even come to himself for two days. The doctor man was sure and said, he can't live. That he's dying. It was a social disease. And see, so I couldn't hardly stand to see my baby die, and I prayed all night. And so I said, Lord, so the eyes was the kind of woman that the Shunammite woman was, but said, Where is your Elisha? And said, I went to sleep, and I dreamed a dream that I was standing here at this gate, and I seen you coming down the street, that little hat kind of sitting on the side of your head, 
But said, there's only one thing. said, where is that? said, you're supposed to have a suitcase in your hand. I said, I just left it down there at the Peabody Hotel. She said, I know that you're supposed to have a suitcase. And she said, my baby's dying. I said, my name's Branham. She said, I was glad to meet you, Parson Branham. I said, I pray for the sick. Mm, had you ever heard of my ministry? She said, no, I don't believe I ever did. She said, why not you come in? I walked in, that big fellow laying there like that. I was trying to tell her about divine healing, but that wasn't what was interesting her. She wanted to hear that boy say he was saved and ready to go. And she said, God saved him. And about a year later, I seen him out there. There's a red cap down at the station. How the Lord does sing. And then when I got back after that, I suppose that plane is supposed to leave at 7 o'clock. And it was about half past nine. And I got a cab and went back and just as I got in, said, last call for flight number four. Yeah. So the Lord helped that plane on the ground there while I went and prayed for that. Yeah, That's it. I was trying to think of that a little. One of them. That's it. Oh, how we used to make that ring in here and clap our hands and say, One of them, one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Hallelujah. One of them. I'm one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. They were gathered in the upper room, all praying in His name. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost, and power for service came. Now what he did for them that day, he'll do for you the same. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them, one of them, one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them, one of them, I'm one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Are you? Listen to this verse. Though these people may not learn to be our boast of worldly fame, they have all received their Pentecost, baptized in Jesus' name, and they're telling now both far and wide, His power is just the same. And I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Oh, one of them. I'm one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. One of them, oh, I'm one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Oh, come, my brother, seek this blessing that will cleanse your heart from sin. It will start the joy bells ringing and will keep your soul on flame. Oh, it's burning now down in my heart. Oh, glory to His name. Now, I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Are you glad of that? One of them, one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Oh, one of them, one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Oh, aren't you glad? Let's just shake hands with one another when we say it. Why do you say it? Let's do it. One of them, one of them. I'm so glad that I can Oh, one of them, oh, one of them, I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Oh, come, my brothers, seek this blessing that will, a soul of flame, that will start the joy bells ringing and will keep your soul on flame. Oh, it's burning now within my heart. Oh, glory to his, let's raise your hands up. Glad that I can say I'm one of them. All together, one of them, one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. I'm one of them, one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Listen close to again now. See, though these people may, may not learn to be, they never come from college, or boast of worldly fame. They have all received their Pentecostal blessing, baptized in Jesus' name, and they're telling now both far and wide. Every little nook and corner, His power is yet the same. I'm so glad that I can say, one of them. Oh, sing it, church. One of them. One of them. I'm so glad that I can say, one of them. Oh, one of them. I'm so glad I can say I'm one of them. Take your little handkerchief now. One of them. One of them. 
I'm so glad I can say one of them, oh, one of them, one of them. I'm so glad that I can say one of them. Praise the Lord. Hey. We're just like children. There's nothing farm about us. God is without form. Is that right? Yes, sir. I'm one of them. One of them. I'm so glad I can say one of them. I'm one of them. One of them. Oh, I'm so glad that I can say it. Are you really happy and say it? Just raise your hand and say, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm glad that I'm one of them. I'm happy to be. Lord God, I'm so happy. One of them. One of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Oh, God, help us to be that. Help us to keep the lights of shining, Lord, as we're marching towards Zion. Grant it, Father. In Jesus' name, we offer our lives to you for service. Amen. 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 For we are marching to Zion, a beautiful, beautiful Zion. For we are marching upward towards Zion, in that beautiful city of God. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in the song with sweet accord. Join in the song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne. Oh, just sing in the spirit. The throne. Oh, we're marching to Zion, that beautiful, beautiful Zion. Oh, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Oh, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching up. To Zion, that beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King. May speak their joys abroad. May speak their joys abroad. Let's sing it. We're marching to Zion. Oh, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion. The beautiful city of God. Oh, don't that scour you. Don't you love those old songs? Yeah, I, I'd rather have them and all you can any of the other kind of songs you can be. Them good old heartfelt songs. Oh, my. I feel so good and happy when I sing yeah, that. Just man. good, my. I just feel like rejoicing. Hallelujah. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will join and comfort give you. Oh, take it everywhere you go. Precious name. Precious name. Oh, how sweet. Oh, how sweet. Oh, Father. And joy of heaven. Precious name. Oh, how sweet. Oh, Heaven, as we bow our heads now, at the name of Jesus, bowing, falling, prostrate at His feet, King of kings in heaven, crown Him when the journey is complete. 
Oh, how sweet. Oh, how sweet. Oh, the very fine joy of heaven. Precious name. Oh, how sweet. Oh, Father, and joy.